Hi everyone, I welcome you all to this session on uh, sustainability education for schools. And uh, as we know that schools are one of the biggest stakeholders in implementing SDG 4.7 and education has been regarded as one of the most important goals for implementing all the other SDGs. So we are over here to discuss about how we can approach sustainability and education for sustainable development for the schools. And we have these wonderful speakers who have a lot of experience and diverse experience in their fields and have been contributing to the field of sustainability for over a period of time. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for taking out your valuable time for agreeing to be on this webinar with us. From the entire team of GNSDF, I would like to thank you all for being here. And uh, I would like to now introduce the speakers. Uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Jamie P. Cloud, who is the founder and the president of uh, Cloud Institute of Sustainability. He has been working in the field of education for sustainable development for a period of time. And uh, through her institute, she has developed uh, frameworks and uh, benchmarks for schools to be implemented on sustainability and uh, she has a wonderful experience with the indicators and the frameworks which can be used so uh, uh, she'll be speaking about that and how we can implement sustainability education for school our next speaker is dr sapna narula who has uh, who is the associate professor and uh, the head of the department of uh, business and sustainability at Terry school of advanced studies india she has been into academics for more than 15 years and has a diverse experience in sustainable agricultural practices, ICT for sustainability, education and sustainable development. And uh, she has been working in the, uh, for the corporate sector for more than uh, 10 or 12 years for uh, implementing CSR uh, in this. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Jamie Levidaro, who is a researcher in applied mathematics. Uh, she has again tried to and has worked on uh, using her skills of applied mathematics and sciences into sustainability and has tried to merge together how it can be used in STEM for uh, sustainability and SDGs. And uh, I welcome you, Jenny. And our last speaker is uh, Dr. Merrick Wosinski, who is the president uh, of uh, Global Network for Sustainable Development. Uh, he is also the adjunct uh, faculty of uh, Arizona State University in psychology and also senior scientist at uh, Global Institute of uh, Sustainability at Arizona State University. And uh, he has a diverse experience again from the field of psychology to education and sustainability. And uh, I hope this session is wonderful and we all learn something new out of this session and use your diverse experience and knowledge in implementing and working in it uh, ahead in our lives. Thank you so much. So uh, now I would request uh, Jamie to start the session and uh, tell her about her experience and her presentation. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, um, we're, I'm very happy to be here. I've been tracking the state of the planet data since 1968 um, and uh, have always known that education was the key. Uh, and one of the things that we've been focusing on um, most recently is defining the field of education for sustainability so we can demonstrate the impact of it. Um, and so one of the documents that I recommend everyone takes a look at is the consensus document of 42 authors from around the world who have come to define the field for ourselves. So many people finally are, are getting in the game of educating for sustainability, but we didn't have a shared understanding of what were the essential elements. And we can't measure the impact of something unless we agree on what that something is. And so um, this is one of the, the uh, I think, important documents to know. It's not the only one, um, but it begins with the thinking 
as you can see at the, the concentric circle at the very core is the thinking and the thinking about the thinking and the attitudes and the ways we apply what we know. And then for school systems, of course, then there's the how are our classrooms structured and what are the practices we use to deliver the curriculum and instruction right out to the nested inside of the organizations that uh, the school systems themselves and are they learning organizations or are they still modeled after the industrial revolution? Are they designed to help us get to, uh, educate for sustainability or not? nested inside the actual buildings with energy and food and transportation and gardens and um, uh, in some cases investments. Um, schools are nested inside the community and so forth. It goes on and on. We think that the most important unit of study is schools and communities learning and working together. And here are the, the um, links if you want to see what uh, those documents are. We then, all 42 authors and many, many people around the world, then have specific materials and frameworks and things we can use. We've all zoomed in on one piece of the elephant, if you will. Uh, none of us does everything that are in the benchmarks, but all of us have taken out a specific, we all have a specific niche. Um, and so you can look at the Cloud Institute's contributions to that. Um, ways that people and school systems around the world are using those benchmarks are in these four ways. You can look at them and say, all right, we're going to adopt them and then aspire to them and start figuring out what we're already doing and what we want to do more of or less of, start doing, stop doing, and so forth. So we can adopt the benchmarks and then carry on. And whether it's in school or after school or camps, because I know one of the goals here is to create some after-school programming linked to the in-school programming, which is ideal because um, you have more time after school. You just don't have all the students after school. So the after-school program would, I imagine, be more of a leadership program and project-based learning component to what's going on in the schools. Um, another way to use the benchmarks is to, to align what you're already doing with the benchmarks. Um, when you're building new curricula or when you're looking at existing. Um, designing uh, everything, assessments, professional development, curriculum, uh, performance criteria, and then finally doing self-assessments and audits and checking in every once in a while to see how close or far we are from where we want to be in education for sustainability. Um, and so today I thought once, once we have that big picture of what is education for sustainability, um, then we zoom in on, for example, what? And so um, we always use Einstein's quote, the significant problems we face can't be solved with the same thinking we use to, to uh, create them in the first place. So what is that different way of thinking that we are um, introducing into school systems and into communities? Um, that's what I'm gonna focus on this morning, some of those big picture frames. So one of the frames that we use, we call it a mental model or a mental map, uh, the actual schema. What's the frame we're operating with that's going to drive behavior that helps us to thrive over time, which is what we mean at the end of the day. Sustain able means thrive over time in our, in our world. Um, so the first one that we like to introduce is that a healthy and sustainable future is possible. We run into a lot of people who think it's game over. I have graduate students whose professors are telling them it's game over. This is irresponsible and incorrect and not the kind of thinking that's going to get us the future we want. So we like to start with, it is possible because the next question, if it's possible, is what are we gonna do? And that drives movement and drives uh, creativity. Um, one way that we um, share that, is, sorry about that, one way that we share um, that kind of attitude is to show people that there is a creative and structural tension between our vision of the future and our current reality. And the more that you, I'll use a little prop, there's a tension that exists between our vision of a sustainable future and where we are right now. There's no question about that. Um, attention seeks resolution. So there are only two ways to resolve that tension. One is to lower our expectations. Maybe not everybody can have a sustainable future, or maybe it'll, we'll just get by. 
Uh, no, we like to stick a nail in it up at the vision and say there's only one way to go, and that is move toward the vision we want. Maybe we need to set goals and interim benchmarks like the SDGs, um, set, set benchmarks along the way to get to the future we want, each time creating just enough tension to keep the movement going. So that's how we think it's actually realistic to assume we're going to turn this ship around and head towards the future we want. Um, with structural tension comes cre emotional tension. <gasps> what if we don't make it? Try to keep that, ch keep channeling that to creative tension because that's where we need everybody focused on the future and on our ability to get there. Another mental model we think is critical is that we're all in this together. We're interdependent on one another and the living systems upon which all life depends. That is a non-negotiable. Whether you like it or not, we are interdependent on one another. And one of the ways, one of the little models we use to show people that is that our economy is completely and utterly dependent on the social and human capital. Uh, try doing business without a contract. We need transportation systems and education and legal systems and healthy people and communities and markets. We need, we need um, policies. We need the social and human capital for an economy to thrive, both of which are ultimately dependent on the natural systems upon which all life and all uh, production depends and all of it's powered by the sun at the end of the day anyway. So what we want is for an, any, all of these systems to work well together over time, understanding that our ultimate dependence is on the natural systems. So we're interdependent on each other and on those natural systems. And this is just one of the models that we use to help people wrap their minds around that. Um, and there's a lot of great systems thinking work and system dynamics education work out there that can help us navigate complexity and interdependence. Another one of the big picture uh, frames that we think are important is to live by the laws of nature. Understand what those operating instructions are for spaceship birth. Um, I ask folks all the time, what is the first law of thermodynamics? Two out of every 1,000 people remember. And that's the one that says matter and energy don't appear or disappear from spaceship birth. There is no such place as a way. Most people don't even know that. It's basic. Uh, and so we want to make sure people understand what those operating instructions are. I've got a few here. There are many more, but there are some kind of non-negotiable ones that would be very useful if everyone knew it. Because then material cycling makes a whole lot more sense if you realize it can't go anywhere. So I have to put it either in the biological cycle or in the techno cycle. So there's no such place as a way is one of the big ones. Diversity makes life possible. It is not something we're supposed to learn how to tolerate it actually makes life possible. Without diversity, we don't have life on this planet. All systems have limits, and I'll circle back around to that one and a little bit more on that. Thresholds, healthy systems have limits. Thresholds that help us to remain healthy and in a state of dynamic equilibrium. That interdependence one I mentioned before, we're all in this together, that is a physical law. Uh, solutions are local. Everything is going to be appropriate to that particular place and particularly for the uh, sustainable development goals. The goals may be the same, but how we implement them will always be appropriate um, at the local level. We have to trust local wisdom. It's a tenet of sustainable community development. Life organizes towards life, or in other words, something always makes it on this planet. And I think it would be great, and what we're all working on is for humans to be in that mix. Hi. Let's be favorable conditions for humans and other life to thrive over time. Pardon me? Sorry. Ah, okay. And things change. Um, nothing so constant has changed. Um, so there is no such thing technically as status quo because things are always changing. And so they're either going to get better or they're going to get worse, depending on what your idea of better and worse is. So I vote for better. Uh, here's another thing that we think is important for people to understand um, in terms of just basically operating within the natural laws and principles. Um, all of the ecosystem services we get for free from nature um, uh, that 
supports life on this planet, whether it's climate regulation functions or oxygen production, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, um, energy. We get all of these uh, resources um, from the earth and it's gonna be a lot cheaper and a lot more strategic to c contribute to the health of these systems so that we can get on with um, doing the things that we need to do. We need to figure out how to unleash our potential and contributing to the health of these ecosystem services is a great way to do it. Um, when economists, uh, sustainable economists, try to put dollar values on these services, they are way more expensive than any of us can afford, and we get the service for free. So why spend money on something we're getting for free? That's perfect, by the way. Uh, another one of our mental models, uh, big picture of uh, education for sustainability, is to tap the power of limits. They are constraints that drive creativity. Limits are not a loss of autonomy and they are not scarcity. They are thresholds beyond which we don't wanna go. So we wanna understand, we don't wanna have too much of any one thing and we don't wanna have not enough in any other one part of the system. We want dynamic equilibrium. That is the state of a healthy system, punctuated by the occasional disruption to keep everything uh, awake on this planet. Um, another thing that I find people know very little about, and it comes from the systems thinking and system dynamics community, is this basic simple concept of stocks and flows. We all kind of understand it, but we don't think of it in this way. Um, stocks are just things, entities that can accumulate, can be depleted, such as water in a bathtub, um, or can accumulate. They can go up or down. And flows make stocks increase or decrease, like a faucet or a drain um, affecting the levels of water in a bathtub. So the notion of stocks and flows, it's the thing that goes up and down, and it's the flows of the faucet or the drain. Um, it's a simple concept. Everybody knows what a bathtub is, um, but let's apply it here in some context that we are clearly not applying in our daily lives. So if our goal is resilience and regeneration, um, if you take money out of your account faster than the interest rate, the outflow being the withdrawal rate, the inflow being the interest and the deposit rate, you will run out of money. And we call that unsustainable. Now everybody kind of knows that, even though we're all uh, spending more than we make, uh, a lot of us. Um, but if you just understand the concept of you can't take out more faster than you put back in, you'll understand stocks and flows. Here's another example, fish stocks. The outflow would be death and catch rate, the inflow would be the replenishment rate. If more fish are removed fat from the ocean faster than the ocean can sustain it or replenish them, there will be no more fish. We call that unsustainable. We, I think, are 90% fished out of the big fish all, uh, all over this planet. So clearly, we didn't understand this basic concept of stocks and flows, or we would have maintained that dynamic equilibrium um, that we so sorely need. This is the result of taking out more faster than can be replenished. Many of you may be familiar with the ecological footprint, which is simply a measure of the supply and demand. Supply being bioproductivity and biocapacity, the, the amount of space times the productivity, and the demand being the demand we're putting on that supply. And at the moment, we are drawing down on the natural capital or the biocapacity at a rate of 50% faster than the replenishment rate, which we call unsustainable. So we need to learn how to live within our means and stocks and flows can help us to do that. Here's another version going in the opposite direction. In this case, the outflow is emissions of CO2 and the inflow is the carbon sequestration and absorption. If more CO2 is emitted faster than the earth can absorb or sequester it, then too much will accumulate and it undermines earth's climate regulation functions. Very simple concept of stocks and flows. Obviously we didn't get the memo or we, would have, we wouldn't be creating the situation we're in and it's unsustainable. So all of these ways of thinking can help us to create a healthy and sustainable future uh, when we employ them in our daily lives. 
a couple more, the mental models uh, that, that reciprocity rules is another big one. Of course, we're going to meet our self-interest. No species on this planet would not attempt to meet its own self-interest. But in the context of interdependence, self-interests are best served through mutually beneficial relationships. Um, an example here is how we measure well-being. We currently use the gross domestic product, the GDP, as a measure of well-being, the total amount of economic activity we think of as a measure of well-being. And yet, there are many other indicators of well-being, uh, the SDGs ha having many of them, the genuine progress indicator being one very robust one, that measures all different aspects of our economic lives that the GDP doesn't count. And I won't go into detail about this. I just want to show you that that old GDP can keep going up. Economic activity can keep going up while our quality of life goes in the opposite direction. There is an inverse correlation. It's a form of reciprocity, but it's not the kind of reciprocity we want to see. We want to see economic activity and quality of life going up together. Um, this is the GDP across many, many countries, all going in the same direction, all going up just fine. Wait for it. There's the genuine progress indicator in those same countries. Clearly, our economy is not contributing to our well-being if you include all of us. And so these are things that we need people to understand in the big picture so that at the local level, we can employ those SDG goals and see that we want it to gear our economic activity toward the future we want and toward well-being and happiness and, um, and equity and um, everything good that we want. Um, and finally, we have, we are all responsible because everything we do and everything we don't do makes a difference. Um, and this is the one that, that I think strikes people the deepest because they don't think about the fact that what they don't do still makes a difference. And I love to use this systems thinking joke. Um, the irony here, of course, is that if you cut that boat in half, you don't get two boats. It's one boat and we're all in it. And so we're all responsible for the place we are in that boat and for what we can do to turn it around. Um, uh, and so I leave you with this ultimate frame. Uh, if it's possible, with this new way of thinking, we can actually get to the future we want. So that is an example of some of the attributes of the benchmarks and of the big thinking of education for sustainability, and just a few examples of how we apply that thinking um, in teaching about and for the future we want. Sustainability education is not always about sustainability, certainly not always about unsustainability. A lot of people have been educated about unsustainability, um, but not for a sustainable future. And that's what we want to focus on. So um, I leave you with some of the ways we might be able to be useful for any of you who are interested and a way to contact us. And so what I will do now is to stop sharing and turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, for the wonderful comments. and. Uh, for giving us the big picture of sustainability. I really like the idea of how you connected uh, the different aspects and we don't look at, look at terms of stocks in, in that format in which you've given us and now we can relate it to that as well. And uh, now I would like uh, Dr. Sapna Narula to uh, speak about Ashina, how- Ashina, can you see me? Yes, yes. ma'am, I can see you. Yeah. Achha, I, I'm unable to see you, I don't know why. Um, hmm. able to see and hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, now I would request Dr. Sapna Narula to start her session and tell us about her. Yeah. So um, I'm glad to be part of this forum. Um, equally glad I was to hear uh, Jamie about the big picture on education and sustainability. 
and uh, it was really heartening to know all the models they are they're working on and actually jamie thank you for setting the stage and just telling how natural uh, you know how we have to preserve natural capital she has also spoken about some data i would start with the case study of my own uh, city new delhi where i live and that will uh, you know open open up uh, a lot of uh, you know uh, opportunities for how uh, what role education for sustainability can, can play in schools i live in new delhi which is uh, going to be uh you know um, after uh, you know a revolution we have had lot of vehicles and other things major problems that we are facing in new delhi are number one air pollution air pollution in india has increased so much but if you talk about new delhi there are three months right from august to october where there is entirely you know the entire sky is cloudy okay uh so uh, you know we work with odd even uh, scheme where only the odd numbers vehicles will be on the roads so government has taken lot of measures to curb air pollution uh, have you know uh, this um, uh, vegetation and uh, other uh, you know methods are being employed we have water sprinklers but Uh, you know this air pollution is causing lot of health hazards small children who are born in new delhi they suffer from bronchitis and other problems next is the water crisis in in a city like delhi we have uh, problems uh, of uh, water not even if you are living in a posh area you have problems of water so who has caused all these problems uh, maybe jemi has spoken from the developed uh, country perspective and i'm speaking from an emerging companies uh, emerging economies perspective where you know we are yet to tackle our economic problems and a whole lot of environmental problems uh, are standing in front of us A lot of policy measures have been taken by central government in India, and also by different state governments. So it is, you know, why education for sustainability is important. We all need to be aware, as Mahatma Gandhi said, that child is the father of the nation, and uh, we all, you know, it starts from our childhood. what we learn in schools goes back to you know higher uh, education system and then we apply that practically into our lives so what i uh, you know what are the opportunities for schools uh, recently you know i was invited by a school in new delhi uh, it was a public school and uh, i was so delighted to see you know when i was in school i didn't have so much knowledge about sustainability to be very frank and i was so it was so amazing to see you know children working for various models and uh, uh, displaying all kind of measures they are taking and if you ask them you know little bit question they'll answer a lot about it and how practically you know these schools in delhi are educating them about sustainability so uh, you know when i asked a couple of questions to students because i was e examining their models and then you know i was uh, judging their competition on uh, a world environment day so i i was really surprised to know that you know uh, where it comes from because these children are facing problems every day they cannot go to school if you know a, an odd number or an even number vehicle is out on on that particular day so uh, i think there is a lot to be done uh, and every year uh, in in our university we have this program called building learning in sustainability science uh, this we started bliss we call it bliss where we we are educating not only the schools but also you know general public about the sustainability and 
and the need to invent new models so uh, we run we ran this summer school for 5 days and believe me it was also you know uh, uh, on, on the web and for 5 days there were lot of participants and their enthusiasm was really worth seeing and uh, so this uh, why why we started bliss at terry uh, school of advanced studies because we thought that uh, there is a need to uh, since we are pioneers in sustainability education in india and we have higher education programs we are doing research in sustainability so uh, it was very timely to inform these the uh, students at an early age so that they know how they can contribute we also worked with uh, rwas which we call as resident welfare associations and uh, we you know our faculty is working with rwas to uh, to educate people about this so i think a uh, lot of work i have done on uh, the businesses side but uh it, as far as schools are concerned there are a lot of problems as well first thing is that we have to generate awareness about about sustainability how do people perceive it in uh, public schools in private funded schools uh, in delhi or in other states in india it might be very easy but in government funded schools you know there are lot of uh, there are only limited resources we barely have any ict based uh, you know educational resources the uh, professor marek has seen some of our you know government schools and uh, private schools so uh, you know with these limited financial resources it becomes very difficult for schools to invent in these models uh awareness campaign if you see delhi we have lot of people coming on roads there are marathons there are um, you know various uh, schemes competitions to generate awareness on social media and i think role of media is very important media uh, has not done enough in our country and also at the global level because you know you know they are just um you know, roaming around hovering around those issues which are at the uh, at the global level and media is not doing enough at the local level glad to know that in india our media has kind of risen to this fact in last few years ever since the problems of air pollution have impacted the lives of people so uh, there is uh, you know a great need to make people aware to make children aware and as jemi has uh, experimented with many uh, you know uh, models i think um, that we have to see these in context of developing countries in the regional context you know what works and what does not work and then maybe we can replicate or scale up these models further then uh, we have lot of uh, you know this awareness can only be generated if we give training to our faculty training to instructors so uh, i think role of media is important role of social media is also very important and there is a need to join uh, there is a need to generate clubs across the various uh, across various schools Their faculty can also participate. So, uh, if we train the teachers, then only you know the uh, you know this will become part of the curriculum. So, not only at the school level, but at the policy level, at the state level, at the regional level, we need to give importance to sustainability. Uh, in Delhi government schools, we have included sustainable development, sustainable development goals. as well as you know training on sustainability but this is all theoretical there is no practical approach um uh, you know our children they actually go to youtube they find various models and you know when they get some assignments they um, they use social media to come up with that model because you know even their parents have not experimented in that space so if i am a parent i did not get that education or 
I was not aware. You know, I am teaching sustainability, but there are many parents who, who who do not know. So there is a you know vacuum in that space. So I think a lot has to be done related to uh, curriculum design. Uh, you know, besides uh, you know uh, just translating these models into these you know, learning material, educational resources, ICTs, and uh, we have to create an ecosystem of all the stakeholders where not only parents teachers students and school administration but also you know the at the policy level at the ncrt is national council for educational research and training in our country ncrt level you know it has to be part of the syllabi uh, at various levels so that people, uh, the students, uh, get awareness about these uh, needs. So uh, it has to find place in the uh, curriculum design, and then, um, as um, uh, you know, uh, as has been highlighted earlier, we need uh, benchmarks. What are the performance indicators? Uh, what are the incentives for students? So if there is a student in the class who is who has invented a new waste management model or who is doing something for the resident welfare uh, welfare association are we giving an incentive to that student for his time uh, how is he you know let me also throw some light on india's education system at school level it is very competitive you know that you know our all um, you know the entire public in india wants to educate their children to become either doctor or engineer so there is a, you know there is a gap in you know the parents do not realize because everyone wants a good future for their children they invest a lot in children's education so uh, there is a lot of competition in this space and uh, they would like uh, all of them to study and get good grades at the cbsc level at the board level but what happens is you know where where is the room for sustainability tell me where everyone is busy preparing notes and doing theoretical models there is no room for sustainability because every parent want nobody wants his uh, you know child to be a sustainable leader uh, in his colony or in his school they want their children to become doctors and engineers so there is also a need to generate awareness at the parental level not only at the yeah, jamie is just uh, you know uh, smiling but uh, this is the reality in india because uh, you know uh, we are living in such a closed mindset we are not open to uh, to to these many changes then uh, we have to give incentives to these children who would be uh, who would like to become change makers when we conducted these summer schools see people are interested they left their school and undergraduate uh, classes and they joined us for that school uh, in fact you know children are more aware than their parents or teachers to be very frank because it is part of their curriculum they are facing the problems they have been raised in such an environment so uh, but you know uh, not only the incentives but what are the inhibitors first i told you that you know the finance is the major inhibitor in developing countries so i think at the global level or regional level we are all you know we go to climate meetings and all we should raise our uh, you know even uh, we should raise our uh, voice towards funding of these events happening <laughs> So there is little funding available. Like everyone would want to uh, fund for a conference, but when you talk about you know funding for school children, nobody would do that. Indian corporations they have lot of CSR budget. Like you know, if you ask them to uh, fund this webinar, you would not find many people to fund any kind of uh, you know such initiative. We have seen Professor Vasinski is you know. We have worked together, and we have seen. So there is a lot of uh, you know opportunity as far as fund generation is concerned. Indian corporations and also multinational corporations they have a huge CSR budget. Uh, 
although they are uh, investing on primary education and secondary education but they should also spend uh, a lot on uh, you know these educational initiatives then interdisciplinarity so uh, you know uh, why there has been a rise in these uh, awareness initiatives or competitions in schools during last 5 years in delhi is because people face the brunt you know after they have disturbed their natural ecosystem so much uh, you know they have they are now suffering from the you know lack of water and other resources so there is a great need of pushing the education system towards interdisciplinarity so once we you know uh, you know every uh, in our schools and i know in most of the schools you know there are various silos and various subjects you know and there is no solution oriented model there is you know nobody would work for if the ground water table in a colony is low nobody would like to work on an interdisciplinary solution right finance is an important part so why don't all these you know uh, interdisciplinarity has to start from the school level then there is also need to have these uh, you know i would request uh, jamie because she is already experimenting so uh, there is a need to have these you know region specific models or nation specific models where you know especially for developing countries uh, where you know that we can make these uh, the implementation at the field level very relevant so um, uh, we also need to work for these models such as social entrepreneurship i would request all of you all the participants and also the faculty to see that what we did as part of the bliss then another initiative that our uh, university started was climate jamboree where uh, you know uh, around uh, 6000 people from various schools participated in a big event for 3 days so this also you may have a look at the website so uh, you know we we need to uh, you know educate we need to have new models uh, and there is um, you know as part of climate jamboree we started a new you know green shift where school students participated they worked on their own environmental based models they brought new projects and which were funded by uh, you know social alpha which is one of the you know a tata initiative so uh, not exactly funded but uh, they were um, you know supported by social alpha and uh, next year they have also committed some support for these uh, competitions so um, i think uh, interdisciplinarity is the key and also you know uh, waste management is one issue that we need to uh, that needs to find place in the curriculum i'm uh, i'm only raising issues that people or uh, you know schools are facing in my own country uh, but i am sure in every country you know they are tech, they are dealing with different kinds of problems and um, uh, so uh, this is how we all need to work together and such webinars that uh, uh, we have you know this webinar series would be really useful and uh, educational resources learning material especially for even disabled children you know uh, this would you know uh, pay in the long run uh, and at the global uh, and national policy level there is a need to generate more funding uh for for such initiatives i would be uh, thank you so much and i would be happy to take questions thank you dr sapna for your wonderful words i totally agree with what she said that the issues in developed uh, developing countries are very different and i agree with the fact that in india every parent is just wanting to make their child a doctor or an engineer or just go into a professional line and they don't consider these things to be very important which they are and uh, also about the issues which she just highlighted i totally agree with her because i've been working with uh, with teachers in nepal and i feel that those issues are very much relevant and uh, 
from what jimmy has done maybe we can all collaborate and work together and maybe mod, uh, modulate the framework so as to that can fit into schools in india and nepal and other developing countries as well uh, thank you so much ma'am for highlighting these issues and uh, we look forward to work together and in the future and trying to implement all these things in india and other countries as well thank you thank you uh, stephen will you take forward from here Okay. All right. Um, so, thank you very much, everyone. I will now go to Jenny, who will take us through our presentation, and um, hopefully, we will not fall in love with maths. Right. Jenny, so, over to you. Hello again, everyone. Well, thank you, uh, Jamie and Sapna, for this interesting insights. I believe they are directly related to the science that I'm going to show you now, and we can discuss maybe or have questions later. So let me share my screen uh, and see how that works. Okay. Uh, let's see. Right. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation now? Yes. Perfect. So, um, Right, uh, so I'm Jenny Livadaru, and uh, uh, on the side of my research, I try to motivate people to focus on science and young kids. So today we'll talk about how science work, can work in favor of sustainable development. And in particular, we'll discuss about the art of fluid dynamics, which is the area of my research. Um, so this is my email, by the way, if you want to contact me at the end. I believe this presentation will be available online. Um, I'll start about this concept of women in science and about inclusion. And I think the best way to do it is to talk about my life and how I became a scientist. So I was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy at the age of 12. Muscular dystrophy is a, a progressive disease. And while I was still walking, I studied civil engineering. So I learned how to build houses, let's say. Um, then I did a master's in water resources technology. So I learned how to uh, create infrastructures for flood protection and water supply. And I worked as a research associate at the National Technical University of Athens doing modeling for sustainable development. Uh, then I worked as an engineering consultant. Yes, in Greece also we want to be engineers and doctors. I was on the engineering side. So, uh, I, I did um, uh, flood protection measures for World Bank and EU transportation projects as an engineering consultant. Uh, then um, uh, after I started using a wheelchair, I decided that I wanted to get exposed in international development. So I did an online course from MIT uh, in poor economics. So it was basically the idea of how to live under a dollar per day with many applications and tests in developing countries and then i moved to the university of cambridge where i did economics for infrastructures and how you regenerate uh, cities how you make cities safer once they get old um, and then i moved to something more technical so i did a phd in fluid dynamics for sustainable development where through my research, I traveled all over the world. I worked with Stephen Hawking. At the end of my research, I did an internship at the UN headquarters where I worked on inclusion, green technologies and urban planning or inclusion at the workplace. So there comes the concept of inclusion in my life. Uh, then I worked as a UN consultant for the Department of Economic and Social Affairs, again at the UN. And now I came back to my research in Cambridge. So this is about me and basically I told you this story because as an individual there were three milestones in my life. One was the use of wheelchair that reshaped me and made me move forward actually instead of holding me back. The second was Cambridge that really reshaped me. The third one was Stephen Hawking um, who gave me more strength to, to keep going in whatever I was doing. So that's about me, and we can discuss about inclusion if you want later. 
Now, I want to talk to you about my science. Um, so I work on fluid mechanics. Fluids are liquids and gases that can deform. When I say deform, imagine a balloon and you push from one side, then the balloon deforms from the side and reforms towards the other side. This is the general principle of fluid mechanics. So liquid and gases, liquids and gases can deform according to where pressure is. High pressure makes fluids move towards areas of lower pressure. And that's the main principle of the physics of fluids. Now, as uh, Jamie said about flows, uh, fluid mechanics and the mathematics of fluid mechanics can be used in economics, where we use the, the mathematics of diff dis diffusion and dispersion to actually predict flows. It can be used in information, so how uh, information is dispersed and how information is spread. So there are many applications of the fluid mechanics mathematics, uh, but today we'll talk about the science and how it's connected to sustainable development. By the way, the picture on the um, bottom right is our building in Cambridge. So if you happen to be in Cambridge, please visit, uh, visit the fluid mechanics lab in Pavilion 8 you'll find me there. Um, so, one more thing. We talk about fluid mechanics, we should talk about the pioneer in fluid mechanics, which was, who was Osborne Reynolds. Uh, I have the privilege to study in Queen's College where he did his mathematics degree. And he defined two flows of liquids. One is the laminar flow, where we're talking about smooth flow, where molecules move at straight lines. And the other one is turbulent flow, where vortices form and there is mixing uh, within the flow. Now, what we do as scientists is we observe the transition from laminar to turbulent flow, so from smooth flow to rough flow, and we try to make the most of this transition energetically in order to form applications that save energy. Uh, now, there is no analytical solution of turbulent flow, uh, so we use mathematics to approximate the problem and to find solutions and applications that can actually work in favor of our environmental protection and climate change adaptations. Um, now, we talked about the, the concept of fluids. Uh, let's see the three different skills that we work with. So in small scales, we work with phenomena that develop in less than one meter. In this category, we can find applications like contact lenses, uh, crystals in our cars, the glasses that we wear. So everything that can be found in liquid form, and then we apply some hydrodynamic processes and then we turn it into solid. And this is how we form all the perfect uh, shaped solid surfaces that you uh, see around, around you. Uh, a second application at this scale could be the shower head. The openings, the openings in the shower head are as big as we sh it sh they should be in order for the rivulet of water to turn into droplets. And we turn the water into droplets because uh, as droplets, they have increased surface tension and they help uh, oil to be removed from our skin or they help the dirt from the uh, dishes to be removed. Uh, so droplets are very important when we take a shower or when we wash the dishes. The third application in that area is basically uh, pharmaceuticals. How do you use fluid mechanics in order to bring molecules together and speed up the ke chemical reactions in order to create cheaper drugs, uh, in order to have drugs available in case of Ebola, let's say, something like a disease that spreads very fast. So... Fluid mechanics can speed up this chemical reactions, and I, have an exp and I have an example to show you a little bit later. So that's the small scale. In the meso scale, uh, where we see phenomena that are less than one, that develop in less than one kilometer, we see the aerodynamics of cars. How do we shape our cars in order for turbulence not to interact with the motion of the car and in order to consume less energy to move? Um, think about a big truck. Uh, between the axis of the front wheels and the axis of the back wheels, uh, you sometimes will see some metallic barriers um, on the sides of the truck. This is because we want to avoid wind coming underneath a truck and create additional friction that would make the truck consume more uh, gasoline to, to develop the same speed. So 
one application is like the aerodynamics of cars and planes, if you want. Second example could be uh, the, the construction of wind parks, how high the wind turbines should be. And if you see here in the picture, every wind turbine creates turbulence at the back as it receives the natural air. So how far the second wind turbine, the, the turbine at the back should be in order to receive natural air and not, let's say, the broken air from the first turbine. This is very important for the efficiency of a wind park. The, the third example in this category could be point sources of pollution, like uh, chimneys from factories or oil spills. I have an example later about that. But what we're interested in is how far the pollutant will go uh, vertically and horizontally in the atmosphere. Uh, will it get stuck over a city? How can we uh, remove it from the city? Or how fast will it go away? Uh, what is city ventilation? We'll discuss about these things later. And third is the macro scale, where we investigate uh, cyclones, typhoons, uh, the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is very important for climate change. Um, what happens basically here is that hot water from the equator uh, at the Atlantic Ocean between, South, between North America and Europe should go up the European coast. And then as it gets colder, moving towards the North Pole should get colder and then sink like a waterfall in the sea and then go back down uh, the American coast and go around the world. What actually happens is because uh, the ice at the North Pole is melting, the density differences that we would expect there for a strong waterfall to occur um, are not that strong. So this waterfall is reduced and this, the whole ocean circulation is weaker. So this smooth temperature that we have on Earth, which is related with the ocean circulation, slowly becomes more abrupt, let's say. Third example of that scale is the formation of galaxies. So I'll show you an example of how we work with fluid mechanics and how we're trying to understand uh, what happens in space with experiments here on Earth. So we saw a broad range of applications, and now I'll give you an example of each scale. Um, this is basically my PhD. So I worked on a device that can speed up chemical reactions. It's basically a testing tube that it's attached to a motor, and there are pipettes that um, feed liquid reactants to the base of the rotating tube. As the tube rotates, it creates a very thin film Within this thin film, molecules come together faster, so reactivity happens faster, and then we have uh, the, the result of the reaction extracted from the top of the tube. Now, this is a device that uh, NASA was interested in, as uh, it's a small device that does this chemical, uh, that does specific chemical reactions in three minutes rather than in three hours. So they were interested in taking this to Mars or to other space exhibitions for real-time experiments. But this is all similar devices uh, will be soon in the market and uh, they will speed up the production of pharmaceuticals, uh, DNA testing or um, uh, genetic experiments as they can fold up proteins. So there are many applications for this device and this is a very new technology. Fun fact about this device, and this is what I'm usually saying when I want to attract people in science. So I'll show you from a high-speed camera one experiment that I was doing. So basically this is the rotating tube and there, are, there was coated water already at the walls of the tube. There's a droplet of water that will fall now and we'll see that it will create some triangular shaped waves that develop both upstream and downstream. And this is the main mechanism uh, that explains why this device performed better in chemical reactivity because these waves create searing and bring the molecules closer. Now, the fun fact is that these waves can be approximated and the mathematics that I used eventually to explain them were very similar with Kelvin ship waves. And Kelvin ship waves can be met when you see a duck swimming into a calm lake. So you see this triangular shape that the duck forms and this is very similar with a droplet that I see in this tiny device. Uh, another fact, fun fact about these triangular waves is that, uh, so if you see at the bottom right again, and maybe you have the cameras now, there are actually two ducks swimming, the one behind the other. 
So the first deck consumes more energy. The deck at the back consumes less energy as the deck at the back takes advantage of the ways that the first deck has created. The same thing can happen with cyclists. The, song, the strongest cyclist goes always at the front and then the other cyclists hide at the back because they make advantage, they take advantage of this triangular waves. The same happens with aircraft. Sometimes you would see in demonstrations where they form these triangular shapes. We're talking again about this Kelvin ship waves that we, I see in my tiny device and you can see in duck swimming, you can see in cyclists, you can see everywhere. So it's all connected as we started from the small scale and we can see that in bigger scales. Now, let's go to more examples. Uh, what happens with sustainable housing? Uh, as I said, we want smooth flows and we investigate their transition to turbulence. Now, turbulence instabilities start with this crazy mushrooms on the left. This mushroom seems, is very similar to this shape of the atomic bomb. And uh, so it starts as a mushroom and you see this crazy hair around the mushroom, which is basically uh, what we call Kelvin Helmholtz instability. It starts with this crest, you can see like in big scale over the mountains uh, with the clouds here. Then it turns into a full vortex and then this full vortex eventually causes uh, uh, full mixing uh, between two liquids or between two fluids or between the same fluid but with different density. For example, when you open the windows to your house, there's cold air coming, so the heated air, which is lighter, goes towards the top and eventually leaves the house. What we do in our uh, lab is that we form a house, we form the interior of a house, we form the windows and the doors and the openings of the, and the rooms in models, and then we use fluids and we try to uh, approximate the time we need for a full ventilation of the house when we open one window, two windows, uh, one door, two doors, what happens with heating. So this is how we model smart houses. And this is how we end up with uh, programs of ventilations in the houses using fluid mechanics. I'll show you a very simple experiment on that. So the tank that you see here has transparent salty water, which is heavier than the water that is behind underneath this metallic frame, which is tap water uh, dyed with green uh, dye. So if I turn on the video now, you will see how these two waters will mix. So we remove the frame and then the lighter water comes up in this mushroomy form and mixes with uh, the denser liquid. The same happens in our house. The same happens with heating in our house. The same thing happens when we open the window in our house. So this is more or less how we model smart houses and uh, how science can help in constructing more sustainable houses. So one more example, and now I think uh, Sapna will relate to this. This is how we ventilate cities. So we have huge tanks and then we put some models of buildings there because buildings can work in favor of city ventilation, uh, like wide openings in roads, skyscrapers, skyscrapers with openings in the middle, um, small houses, how everything interacts in order to enhance the ventilation of the city. A typical experiment that we, that we use, and now you can't see, but on the bottom here, there's a whole uh, city in like tiny Legos. Um, and what we do, we use a tank, and then we use different fluids in order to measure uh, how much time we need for the for the city actually to uh, to change the to change the air conditions on over the city. So this is the the, the mesoscale example with the green housing. And now I think it's time to go to yeah jets and plumes. Last mesoscale example: how we deal with pollution. So again, we have this transition to instability, which is very important. And when it comes to pollution, what happens is that uh, we have chimneys and oil spills. And this mushrooms of mixing happen, are created of the side. And you can see on the video on the right, uh, a black pollutant and its environment filled with uh, black particles. What you see is that this crazy noise, no, 
knows and the crazy mushroom drags its environment in it so it drags the particles in it which means that um, if we are late in dealing with a pollutant uh, what happens is that we have to deal with more uh, quantity of air or water that we're going to deal with at the end so when pollution happens we need to act fast um, in Cambridge, what we do is we simulate these things. We simulate the pollutants. We try to see uh, the geographical conditions or the wind speeds, and we kind of forecast where the where the pollutant will go and how we can treat it. Last but not least, we're going to the very big scale now, and this and we're going to connect it with uh, the small scale. So my involvement with Stephen Hawking was. The, uh, that accidentally in my experiments with single droplets, I ended up uh, simulating the formation of galaxies. And this is the beauty of science. So we live in the galaxy of Milky Way, which has 200 to 400 billion stars, and uh, galaxies have galactic arms. So what happens in a galaxy is you have black holes that are poles of gravity and you have stars uh, flowing in rotation, going towards the, the center of the galaxy. Now, there are shock waves in the galaxy that form these spirals, and the stars basically move towards the shock wave, then they're delayed there, and then they speed up again. Imagine that a shock wave is like um, you going on a highway and suddenly finding traffic. You keep going, but you reduce your speed. This is what happens with the stars when they meet a galactic arm. They st they're still going, but they reduce their speed. Now, I guess you, you see the, the video chat here, but I'm going to turn this on and I bet you can see. This is an experiment I did with a single droplet in a rotating disk. And what you basically see here is that this is from a high-speed camera. So as the video, as the droplet spreads, we see this spiral waves that are the same type of waves that you see, waves that you see in a galaxy. So by investigating these waves that I see in a single droplet, you can understand the age of the galaxy, the density of the galaxy, the number of stars that could potentially be solar, solar systems. So there you go. That's the beauty of my science. And uh, I think I should summarize everything now. So we talked about fluids. We, we talked about how the transition to instabilities can help us uh, design more sustainable infrastructures. We discussed about several applications and hopefully there are some observations that uh, we can uh, see things in our environment that will inspire us to, to, to observe fluid mechanics. Um, one more fact, there are, there are fluid mechanics in art. So on the right you can see the starry night of Van Gogh which is clearly vortices in the sky. And on the very right, you can see the great wave of Hokusai, which is clearly a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, as I showed you before. So thank you very much. And I can uh, take questions. Thank you very, very much, um, Jenny, for that enlightening. Let me, let me see how I can stop sharing my screen sharing now. Screen, yeah. Thank you, thank you very, very much. I personally have learned something quite new. I never understood the importance of why we have to have showers, water dropping and droplets. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of discussion about droplets. Now thank I you. stop share. Right. Okay. Yeah. Done. All right. So we'll, we'll get into questions shortly. So if you have any questions, please type it in the chat menu or just note it down. When we come to have questions, we'll take all of them. Um, now I would hand over to Dr. Marek to quickly take us through his presentation, the last one for today. Okay, okay. So good, good morning, everyone. Well, I I have prepared my PowerPoint notes, but uh, I just uh, my main goal of my presentation was to somehow relate to uh, the presentations we already had and share with you some reflections and connect them with the goals of our network. And so I will go back to this, uh, to this PowerPoint note in a moment after I share with you my, my, my first reflections over what we heard. Well, first, first of all, I think it was absolutely great that we had like three different perspectives on sustainability here. The first, we had kind of a general big vision uh, of the whole system 
and showing that uh, the world is a system and to really understand it we need to have used the system thinking and we without knowing that everything is related to everything we just can move forward then we had sort of perspective from the ground label when uh, Sapna was talking, Dr. Sapna was talking from the perspective of uh, education in specific cultural economic context, showing what kind of challenges are there and showing that that this is so important that we need to we need to invest in education. And then we had the example of a very specific discipline, which is focused on one particular aspect of sustainability and, and also showing how complex it is and also how, how, how much we can discover if we, if we go into depth here. But everything shows how, how complex is the issue. Uh, you know, I, uh, I am a psychologist and in the background. And in psychology, we have this concept of uh, cognitive structures, which is basically everything what we know about the universe, about the world, about life, which we have in our, in our brain here. And psychologists say that these cognitive structures, they have their individual characteristics. Namely, there are some people who have very simple cognitive structures, and there are people who have very complex cognitive structures. People with simple cognitive structures simply walk through the, through the world, through life, and put everything black, white, black, white, black, white. So it's, it's life and the world and everything is relatively simple for them. And on the other end, we have people who have, uh, for whom everything is connected with everything. They, 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 they know that each element has an impact on the other element. And sometimes these people have very hard time to make a decision, you know, what to do, because they, they see all complex consequences of, of any, any kind of their actions. And all the rest of population is somewhere in between. Well, whether we like it or not, but there is a lot of people with simple cognitive structures in this world. And uh, now we can imagine that it will be relatively easy to work and educate people about this complexity of the world to people who have complex cognitive structures. But we, 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 must, we, we will face some difficulties when we will try to teach this majority of the population which have really hard time to understand this whole complexity. So this is the first reflection. The other reflection is related to my experience with teachers training. When we talk about education, we, we, we have to talk about students, we have to talk about teachers, and we have to talk about the context. Well, we, uh, we have done a lot of teachers training when I was still back in Poland. And we did also some research on the impact of this uh, teachers training on, on their everyday behavior, their teaching behavior. And what we found was really interesting that when there was kind of normal situation without any difficulties or stress, the teachers were able to apply new skills and new knowledge they acquired during the training. But whenever the situation became difficult or stressful, they were immediately going back to their old patterns of behavior, to this you know, habitual type of uh, solving problems which they brought, I don't know, from where, from, from, from childhood, from university, from whatever. So it, see, it shows that training of teachers, it's, it, it's a difficult task. Uh, we, we, we just, we, and if we want to really success, have success with educating students, well, we need to start with educating teachers first. The other aspect here is, you know, I don't know whether I always talk about this uh, at uh, each occasion. There was this experiment in Malaysia. Uh, the government of Malaysia wanted to create smart schools in the whole country and to implement informational technology into uh, the educational process and they equipped all the all the schools with with you know nice computers and laboratories and everything and so on and after 15 years they started to do research on the impact it had on 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 the society on the educational system and so on. and surprisingly they found there was no impact there was no impact at all and they started to think what happened what was the what was the reason and they just realized that they forgot about a couple of things. First, they forgot to teach, to motivate teachers to use all this equipment. They forgot to teach them how to use it. And they also forgot to, to teach the community about the new approach to learning, which is using technology. 
So, you know, the child was coming back home with the tablet and showing to grandma and grandma was saying, what a stupid thing, you know, we just need to memorize this chapter and pass the test. And so that seems that if we want to make kind of any innovation, we need to first motivate people to, to, to apply it and we need to educate the whole social context about this so they will get support in their efforts to, 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 to do something new. And that, that shows again, again the, 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 the very, very big complexity of the thing. I just to open my, my PowerPoint now. Okay, just one second. Okay, and then I need to open how how do I how do I share the screen here? It just got lost. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Am I still at the meeting? Yes, I am. Share the screen. Okay. Share. Okay, do you see? Yes. Yes. Yes, okay. And now I need to go to, to my screen again. And uh, no, that's not the right one. What what do you see there? Do you see the slideshow or not yet? We see your slide, but it's not um we've not started playing it yet. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now, yeah, now we can see. Okay, okay. So you know like we heard uh, in, in, in almost almost every presentation that we need to work everybody with everybody, that we need to have global partnership. At the end of Millennium Development Goals, uh, the, the main discussion was how to, how to organize our work together in the world after post-Millennium era. And everybody was saying, we need to have global partnership. But you see, uh, partnership in all these areas it's not so simple. You just can't say, you know, do this and, and everybody will work with everybody. Uh, people need to have communication skills. People need to have uh, uh, knowledge how to, how to resolve problems together. And, and first and foremost, they need to be motivated to do it. Because if you don't have motivation to, to do it, well, it will not work. The, I, was, I, I always, always talk about this in, in any kind of context, that I participated in the Congress organized by UNESCO a couple of years ago in Paris on the future of education and future of university. And one of the conclusions was that information, providing information is not anymore the purpose of education because people can click on the computer and find any kind of information they want. So what education should do, we should first, uh, teach students how motivate students to, to search for information, teach them how to find it, teach them how to evaluate it because there is a lot of garbage there, and also teach them how to use it, how to apply it, because information which is not applicable is, is practically useless. So that, that, that would change somehow our perspective to education. If you look at the many schools all around the world, they are still uh, believing that providing information will change people's behavior. You know, people involved in informational technology for many years used to think that providing information is the most important thing. It's not. It's not enough. You may know absolutely everything about everything and do nothing. So basically, we, it simply means that in our educational process, we need to somehow teach people, motivate people to use information and teach them how to use it. So I will not go to the definition of, of sustainable development because that just doesn't make sense. And that's, you know, in this context, we created in 2014, this global network of sustainable development. Uh, the idea came from young community leaders from Africa who were just saying, okay, we just need to create some ways to teach young people how to, how to create these partnerships. And uh, so that, that, that's how, uh, how we, we, we created this. If you go to our website on, on, on the page for mission, you will find the video uh, made by Jill Hicks uh, from Australia. Uh, if, you, if you had no chance to see it, I, I strongly recommend it. She was in, in the underground uh, uh, in London when there was a terrorist attack. 
and the 20 people or something were killed around her, she lost both, both of her legs. And uh, for her, it was like a life-changing experience. So she created the organization teaching about peace and nonviolent conflict resolutions. And one of the missions she's uh, saying, she's giving is, we, we just need to uh, teach young people, to teach, uh, to teach the society that there are, we have much more in common than we have differences, that we are the same human race and that we shouldn't divide us into enemy and we, and we and the others. And this can be done only if we go very early to the, to the, to the childhood and to, to we, are, we, we are talking to young people. So this GNSD was officially launched in Nepal in 2014 uh, as because it had kind of a symbolic meaning because Nepal is still one of the poorest countries in the world. So we just did it there. And uh, talking about children, uh, we had a conference in Delhi uh, a year ago where we invited uh, kids from fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade to talk about uh, the problems of the world and to, to, to give suggestions how the problems could be resolved. It was absolutely amazing. You couldn't believe that these young kids, fourth graders or sixth graders, they had big vision of, of the world. They had uh, solutions. They could make a speech as a president of the country. And the question after we had a long discussion later, what is happening with this? With this creativity, with this vision, with, with uh, motivation to, to do something, when they go through the educational process and come, come to, the, to the moment they have to choose the profession and they ask parents where should they go to school, well, parents say you need to be a doctor or an engineer. Nobody, nobody says, okay, you need to be a social worker, you need to be a community builder, you need to be a sustainable scientist and so on. So somehow our educational system is not doing a good job to teach people that they should be involved in the change of the world and, and fixing all these problems the world is facing. Well, we had a lot of discussions at Arizona State University about this problem that, uh, you know, only 10% of students know something about sustainability, community building, community projects, uh, uh, climate change and so on those who choose very special uh, majors. 90% of students who choose all sorts of other majors, they know nothing about this. And they later go to the government, they are responsible for funding, they are responsible for policies, but they, they, they have no idea how important those things are. So uh, we, we had a lot of discussions how to, how to change it, how to, how to create this global perspective and show that, that, uh, that there are some things which are really important nowadays. So what is the mission of GNSD? This, this, this was basically our mission. We wanted to facilitate the involvement of young people in the realization of uh, sustainable development goals, but through active participation in peace and sustainability clubs. That's what we started to do. We started to create sustainability and peace clubs in schools, extracurriculum activities. We heard in our presentations a lot about curriculum and about including uh, sustainability knowledge into the curriculum. It's not easy. You know, I, I, I was talking to governmental officials in India, governmental officials in Nepal, governmental officials in the US, and it's always the same. You can't change curriculum without the approval of the Department of Education. And people who are creating policies in the Department of Education they sometimes don't have any experience in teaching at all. They, they, they're just coming from, from totally another field. So we, we just really need to make a big, big, big work to, to train policymakers and teachers about the importance of, of sustainability. And then, you know, we just need to use this principle of learning by doing, that we are not only providing information, but we are involving students in doing certain things, involving them in community projects, involving them in activities of the club, because this is the only way to create motivation. If they do something small successfully, they, they will believe that they can do another thing successfully, and they will get involved in another thing, and they will be, they will be motivated to become a change maker. And uh, also, we, we just realized that it's so important to create a platform where young children can communicate with each other 
you know, globally over the borders because they, we need to learn from each other and from other countries what, uh, what, uh, what are the differences in the way we approach the, the problems of the world. So these are a couple of photos of, you know, the presence of the network in, in different places in India, in, in United Nations and in, in some other conferences. So who can become a member? Anybody. Uh, all children and all teachers and com community leaders and youth workers and everybody, they will have different roles. Uh, leaders, teachers, parents, coaches, they will mentor the clubs and the students will be simply involved in clubs, clubs activities. Well, you see, there is this saying that if we are setting an organization or teaching program, uh, the goals for this teaching program should be smart should be smart. And this is kind of interesting uh, diagram showing that the, the targets and goals have to be very specific. We need to know what we are planning to improve. They have to be measurable. They, we, we have to be able somehow to quantify the, the, the result of it. Otherwise, if it's not measurable, how do we know whether our project was effective or not? They have to be assignable. We have to know who will do it. it it's it's nice to create big, big, big vision of something, but if we don't assign it, the elements of the vision to particular people, nothing will happen. It has to be realistic that we, that, that these goals can be really achieved, giving, taking into consideration resources and funding. We were talking about funding also today. And finally, we need to uh, set specific time, time uh, which the results should be achieved. It, it doesn't make sense to create tasks and goals which are like forever. We need to be very specific here. You know, it's kind of interesting that this concept of smartness uh, it was used also in a totally different uh, context. Uh, it was introduced by IBM and it was the smartest decision they could ever make because they created for themselves a market. They are producing computers and software and everything. So everybody started to talk about smart cities, smart school, and everybody needs computers and softwares. And so, so IBM got a huge, huge, huge business. So this is, this is a photo of a smart school in Japan. You know, each child has a tablet. They have com computers and, and laboratories and everything. And, uh, but this is, this is the photo of, of a school in, in India where you know, all children have just one monitor and, and they have to gather the whole school to watch something on this monitor and, and that's basically it. And there are a lot of schools in Nepal and in India who don't even have one monitor and they don't have even electricity and they don't have even, even you know, access to the internet. So this is, this is an example. This is on the, on, the, on, the, on the left, this is the school in Nepal, one of the in the rural area of Nepal. And this is the school in Poland. Uh, private school, Catholic school, uh, which has f fantastic resources. And below you have the photo of the laboratory in the school and there are computers and everything. And here you have the classroom in the school in Nepal, when practically they have only the floor and the teacher and nothing else. I, Sapna, I, 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 I hope you, you will agree with me that there are tons of schools like this in India, these governmental schools, where they have only the teacher and the floor. And uh, the same is in Nepal, and the same is in some African countries. So, you know, at the first, uh, uh, the first uh, enthusiasm about smart learning and smart schools, people started to say, oh, oh, okay, wait, slow down, slow down. Because if we really start to equip all the schools in developed countries, in all these computers and, and access to internet, we are increasing disparity between developing countries and developed countries. Because these schools in, in developed countries, they, developing countries, they don't have access to educational resources at all, while the others have more and more resources and they grow. So instead of investing in smart schools and smart learning, well, we should invest a little bit more into developing schools and improving the quality of teaching in schools in developing countries. And that's how we came with this, with this concept of smart uh, sm uh, sister schools, uh, where we are trying to connect schools in, uh, in 
in uh, Nepal and in India and in some other countries with schools in, in, uh, in developed countries. And the first partnership was between the school in Poland, the school in Poland, the school in, in Nepal. Uh, they invited uh, the coordinator from Nepal to, to Poland. We had several meetings. Uh, we, we had program on the radio, we had program on TV, which was trying to make publicity for this whole thing. And, and this seems that this is, this is the project which will take, kind of takes over. So the school in Poland raised some money in about a month. They purchased computer and, and, uh, and uh, all, all the installed electricity and, and, and so on. There was a big celebration of this. And so the school, the school was really grateful for this. And now they are ready to start collaboration because they can at least communicate through the, through the, through the computer and through the, through the internet. So, you know, it seems impossible when you look at this big picture, this whole vision which was presented by uh, Jamie, well, uh, yes, you, 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 you always feel like you should, you, should, you, should, you should pull down, you know, because the vision is too high and because it seems impossible. But on the other side, you can use this approach which was presented by Nelson Mandela and you, and you know his life story, that it always seems impossible until it's done. So if we make some efforts and if we, if we try to unify our efforts, if we try to collaborate together, if, if we make the projects which are very specific and, uh, and uh, measurable and effective, well, then, then maybe we will we'll do it. And when we will do it, it will, it will seem possible. So that's my, my kind of remarks after everything what, you, what we heard today. And now I understand we will have time for questions. And, and my suggestion would be that you could ask the questions first, and then the speakers could just select which question they are, they are feeling they, they are ready to answer. And that, that's how we'll do it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mary. Can we all just um, clap for all our speakers? They've done a fantastic job today. Thank you very much, everyone, for speaking. Uh, now we would open the floor up to questions. So please, if you have any question, just unmute yourself and then ask your question. Please, all our speakers, we take note of the question, then feel free to answer. Okay, let's let's take questions. <coughs> yeah, um, <coughs> can I, can I ask my question, uh, Stephen? Yes, um, UG, you can ask questions. Um, please, everybody, take note. Let's be specific and straight to the point because we don't have a lot of time left on the call. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. And uh, I'm going to be very brief. And um, just coming back to uh, Dr. Marek's uh, presentation, which he was, um, to me, uh, simply presenting what we do in Cameroon in terms of creating a sustainable club. So, of course, um, our clubs are not just coming now, but uh, they are clubs we've been working with in schools for over 15 years with the MDGs. And um, these clubs initially were known as human rights and peace clubs. And in 2018, we transformed them to human rights, peace, and SDG clubs. I'm sure if you get to our website, you'll see some of the pictures of you know, creating the SDGs clubs and hosting the SDG flags and having the clubs in place. And one of the things we do, just like Dr. Marek was saying, was uh, usually we'll start with training the teachers because if the teachers are not motivated, then be sure that those clubs are not going to work. Uh, that said, I think what interests me most um, is the smart, the smart, um, uh, smart sister school initiative. Uh, which we will be grateful uh, if this could also be implemented in Cameroon. I think we could do a pilot project with one of the schools in the, developing, in the developed world uh, with one in Cameroon. And this could be like a pilot for Africa. I think we should start reflecting on that. Uh, it's true the most difficult thing in managing these clubs is funding. And we have to start reflecting on that. It is very important. Uh, because the moment you can motivate the teachers and the students, then it's difficult for the clubs to work. Because what we do, um, every semester we bring our clubs together in a cultural manifestation where 
the students of the various clubs compete. And when they compete, we offer prizes. We give them prizes. We give them trophies. But you also have to transport them. So you pay for that. And you also have to feed them during that occasion. So it's usually very interesting. I wish one of you, maybe Dr. Mare, could have that opportunity of coming to Cameroon to participate in one of our cultural manifestations. And then you'll get another experience of what we do. Uh, so like I'm saying, uh, the Sister School uh, Initiative uh, can be very interesting because um, uh, I had presented this to the club coordinators that are the teachers, and they were really, really interesting. They were really interested, you know, and uh, they wish any of them could have an opportunity of, you know, uh, experiencing or witnessing how this, this works with, with other schools uh, in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much, Eugene. Um, any other question? Comment. Question or comments? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I really liked, uh, you know, the way they are doing in Cameroon. Um, and uh, I, I think that's the way to do at the field level uh, so that, you know, to make people, small children aware and educate them. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Dr. Sapna. Uh, do I have any other question? Well, okay. oh, sorry. Please go no, on. No, no. If, if there are questions, that's great. It's better for us to answer questions. I have, I, um, I want to discuss more some of the things that were said. So, but I'll wait till we can see if there's more questions. Okay. All right. So the, I have one uh, question for Satna. Um, there's a tech hub forming in India lately, and there's a lot of funding coming from developed countries to India. So would technic companies that seem to gather the money right now in India uh, somehow yeah. contribute in this awareness and in this environmental problems that India is facing right now? And would there be like any government incentives for the tech companies to actually invest the money for these causes? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I know about this tech hub. And um, they're doing it, and uh, you know our governments have increased funding lately, uh, but not that you know that that would be able to sustain the entire initiative. Uh, so uh, I think governments should pay more attention. Uh, in fact, you know uh, what I uh, you know the diversity in our country is really so great. Uh, so much of diversity even in the schools. So we'll have various types of schools where, you know, you will not even find a, a simple blackboard or there will be, uh, you know, many schools where, uh, you know, you will have all those smart classrooms. And so where, once you come here and you will find that, you know, uh, there is a whole lot of diversity while, you know, these uh, private funded, uh, you know, schools uh, would would be having more resources, but government schools would need more resources. Uh, so uh, they have started something in Delhi uh, at the state uh, government level, uh, but it, it is yet to reach to the masses. Delhi covers only, you know, less than 1% or, you know, maybe very meager population, uh, you know, which resides in India and uh, so there is a, uh, and also, you know, when uh, Dr. Professor Vosinski was showing me the pictures, you can see that, you know, they, these children, they come from different backgrounds and the relevance and the meaning of sustainability is different from them, for, for all of them. So in one kind of classroom where you have all air conditions and uh, where you have uh, all those facilities, smart classrooms, you know, the meaning of sustainability would be entirely different uh, from those who are studying in villages under open sky with no resources and only an instructor. So, you know, those who do not have access to electricity, those who do not have access to water. I've seen many schools where you know, even electricity is not there in the villages of Odisha. So, uh, so the, the meaning and relevance of this world's uh, word sustainability would entirely be different. So, 
what we need is you know different kind of programs different kind of educational initiatives uh, and um, sustainability can be practiced by both cohorts but how that will be different so uh, uh, a question for jamie one question for jamie uh, thank you thank you okay dr samar uh, jamie yes. that's a question for you how what would be your suggestion how should we work with uh, teachers and people who have limited capacity to understand the complexity of the world and these people with simple cognitive structures how, how should we work with them so um the way that we do it because we change curriculum all the time everywhere we go because the the interesting secret is curriculum is very formally presented in every country in every state and district and it usually has to do with the disciplines and the content and skills but we do what we call sustainableize the curriculum everywhere we go we we embed these different ways of thinking right into the math and the science and the history and the the language uh, curriculum so the way that we do it is that we ask for when we go into a system we ask for volunteers first of all to come and spend one day or two days with us because and, and to get three outcomes the first is a shared understanding and a vocabulary for what the heck is sustainability the second is for everyone to develop a personal rationale for why they should care about it and the environment is only the rationale for 29% of the people consistently over time. There are many reasons why people are interested in this. And the third outcome is to become inspired and hopeful about contributing to a sustainable future through education. In the case of school systems, we need educators to understand the unique contribution that only educators can play because we are in the thinking business. And so they need to understand how important they are. Uh, in that in that shift we cr create a series of ex experiential transformative learning uh, experiences so that they they recognize the ways of thinking that are driving unsustainability and then they get introduced to that different way of thinking that I talked about and they begin immediately to apply it into their curriculum and so but when i say curriculum i mean the operating curriculum they take a look at what they're already doing and they say where are the opportunities to embed some of these ways of thinking some of this content into my existing course no such thing as an add-on because there's never going to be more time so in the same amount of time how can we make this unit of study or this course more relevant more engaging uh more able to educate for sustainability and that's how we do it and we start with the early adopters the people who volunteer and their job is to make the results visible desirable and doable for the next cohort and then we get a next cohort and then we get a third and by the time we're we've got a fourth cohort everybody's doing it because it's it's amazing work it's it's wonderful it's, pardon me well, but you, you know, I, 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 you know, sound really optimistic here, but I, 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 I think you agree that in the United States we have, for example, in the United States we have negative selection to teachers' profession. That you know, we have the saying that if you can't do anything else, you can still be a teacher. And the quality of teachers, yes, we have absolutely fantastic teachers, but there is a big amount of teachers who are simply not capable to to to, to understand complexity of things. What do we do with them? I, I, I disagree. I think neuroplasticity is possible. Uh, the, the, what the brain scientists will tell us is that the ease of shifting a mental model or a cognitive framework depends on how much your identity, your status, and your money are tied to that frame. So if you see that your life is going to be better, if you shift your frame, you're going to be more likely to do it. And when teachers see that students get more engaged, perform better on all the tests, as well as attend classes, and are more interested in what they're learning, there's no teacher, I don't care if it's a good one or a, a, a challenged one, there's no teacher that doesn't want their kids to do better. That's why we get up so early in the morning. We will all want our kids to thrive. And when we see that educating for sustainability helps them to do that and gets them to perform better, they're in. 
Maybe that's the only reason they're in. Maybe they don't even care about the environment, but they care about their kids um, and, and the health and well-being. So I have not found any anybody who is so stuck in their frame that they don't want to engage in this work. Not one time in 30 years. Um, sometimes they're not ready to take the first step, but that's why we take, we work with the early adopters. So we use a combination of the innovation diffusion theory of change and the U theory or theory U from Otto Sharma. Uh, people who work with you, who, who are the teachers who are coming to see so, so I just want to add to what uh, Jamie said. Uh, in fact, I spoke with a lot of teachers in Delhi schools where I was invited. And, um, you know, I, I had the same observation. Although it was more workload for them, uh, they used to stay behind schedule. But still, you know, uh, it, it appeared that they were enjoying the work. And, uh, you know, they were, uh, I found them pretty engaged with the kids. In fact, you know, uh, it, it came from the, uh, the knowledge part came from the kids itself. Yeah. Because yeah. I told you that, uh, you know, kids can, you know, use YouTube and other things to, you know, make those scientific, scientific and sustainable models. Uh, but, you know, uh, teachers were really motivating. So, it takes uh, more time. I agree that it takes more time up front to make the change, but you save time over time because you have less time spent on remediation, less time trying to get kids engaged. You're better organized. You know exactly what you want to do. You waste less time. Um, so teachers are secretly happy that they're saving time. They don't want me to tell the administrators because then they'll give them more work. But, um, but we, we yeah. find that they, they're happy. Uh, and yeah. teacher happiness is a key uh, factor. Indicator. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, so it's because you said uh, British council. Yeah. British council had organized this, and uh, you know there is a all the schools in Delhi are competing to get that British council certification uh, for promoting uh, sustainability in schools. So what I found that they were quite happy with the certificate as well because it has added. It was an added advantage for the school. Sure. And, uh, yeah. So this was a medal in their, uh, you know, around their neck. So that's why, you know, they actually appreciate. They did it for that certification that they got, got from British Council. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's uh, that's how, you know. Yeah. Stephen, were you yeah. trying to get some a word in edgewise? Yes, I was yeah. trying to say uh, how to move to other people so that other people can have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, any other person with a question? Yeah, Jame. Uh, yes, yeah, Stephen, I have a question for okay. for, for, for Jame. Uh, Jame, how, how can you, could you share your curriculum with us? Um, equally, I don't know if I'm asking too much, but this will be a nice um, course to undertake with our teachers in Cameroon. That means sure. if uh, naturally school will be starting in September. And when schools start, usually what we do is we bring our teachers together for a refresher course. And if there are new schools that we've engaged, they participate in taking the training on how to create and manage their clubs. So this is always an occasion um, for new things like this kind of curriculum. We have our own uh, specific curriculum on human rights and you know knowing the SDGs and so on. But I think this is much more innovative, and uh, uh, I don't know how possible it possible it is for GNSD to bring to bring Jame to Cameroon to train <laughs> our teachers on this curriculum on sustainability. In the short Thank run, you. what I could do is give you the facilitator's guide for that intro that I was describing, and then we could get on Skype, get on Zoom and do a little um, capacity building and, and professional development, training of trainers, if you will. Um, I've done that before with people in different countries in Africa and different parts of the world when they have no money and no time and no ability to, to, to get me there. There's always a way. So I'm happy okay. to do that if you want to. You just have to give me your deadline and then we'll have to figure out uh, how to do the coaching. And what we could do is is anybody in the network 
we could probably do it simultaneously so anybody can we can pick a time and then people can join together um, but it's a lot of fun and sometimes there's no electricity and no internet so we're on the phone we're on zoom you know we get it done and, and we have great results I have an idea uh, seeing Jenny's videos so in fact you know if we prepare these uh, uh, small and useful videos for children uh, you know where we could showcase new research which is coming up in sustainability and how you know they uh, so that would be more engaging and these videos could be available on uh, you know through social media and others so uh, that's just a thought okay uh, uh, Jenny, how long I... will you need? I'm sorry I'll come to you Jenny um, yeah. Jenny how long will you need to conduct this training so that if you're planning something for people in the network we can plan effectively how much time do you have <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, when normally, I think, you know, we tried to do it in at least one or two two hour sessions, something like that, or one, one to two hour sessions. It's not instant orange juice. Okay. You know, it, it takes a while. Um, it's easier if people read the facilitator's guide before we get on together. It's easier, you know, if people have time to really devote to it then the, the interactive time doesn't have to take that long. Um, uh, if they didn't have a chance to look at it, it takes longer. You know, it depends on how motivated everybody is to really prepare for those sessions. But I would think that one or two two-hour sessions, um, it, everything's in the facilitator's guide, so it's all there. It's just that you know, a, a chance to ask questions and ask why do we do this and how long does this take and all of that, that saves people a lot of time. And you would want to, teachers are a tough audience, so you don't want to, um, you, you want to make sure you feel ready and confident, you know, if you're going to try this for the first time in front of a live audience. Okay, we'll talk, we'll organize with um, Eugene and then get back to you on it. Sure. Jenny, you wanted to say something? Yeah, just to uh, reply to something about the YouTube videos. So, this was just me gathering videos and dividing it in three different skills just to show you how applicable science is to sustainable yeah. development. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, that could be a channel. I agree. We have this type of videos all the time, but you know, crazy mathematicians, they're focused on their research and sometimes there's no connection between society and research. So I think it's crucial to be connected. Yeah, a YouTube channels could be a solution, but this this was my initiative now to show you how we're connected. But yeah, it can happen in the future. So that far, so it's me exciting. giving talks to places and showing okay. stuff. I was um, just working with a bunch of math teachers who were asking me, "What's math got to do with sustainability?" I said, "Just, just you wait." So that's so exciting. Yeah, I'm sorry. We have only six minutes left on the call for two hours to lap. So. I would quickly give the speaker a minute to summarize their thoughts and then a passing word that our audience can go with. So let's start with um, Jamie and then we'll come to Sapna and then Jenny and then Dr. Marek. Okay. Um, so just a couple of thoughts. I made some notes as everyone was talking and, and having a conversation. Um, of course, as I mentioned, everything is locally appropriate. Um, and there are some things that are true no matter where you are. And I think it's useful to, to constantly ask what is universal and what is only appropriate locally. Um, that's one thing that, that I would say. Um, the science is the science. How to apply it, how to teach it at the local level, that's going to be appropriate to that local place. But the, the science is the science, things like that. The other one is that it doesn't cost any more to educate for sustainability than it does to educate for unsustainability. We've clearly been educating for unsustainability unintentionally. And that's very expensive. And so what I would argue is that it actually can cost us less money to educate for sustainability, particularly if you're taking into account the full cost accounting and all the prices for paying for not doing it well the first time. And then lastly, I would say that um, 
the more we focus on the problems, the more we reinforce the thinking that caused the problem. And that we need to make sure that we're educating for sustainability and not always about unsustainability. Um, I, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Dr. Sapna? Uh, so I would uh, sum up, uh, it was an interesting discussion, and I would sum up by saying that uh, I just picked up from uh, Jamie that uh, um, although, you know, some things are universal, but we have to apply it, you know, we have to see how to apply it at the local level. Mm -hmm. So I think first point is that how do we address the diversity um, in various kinds of uh, school curriculum. Second thing is that uh, while we are implementing education in sustainability, we have to pay attention uh, to the systems and processes at various educational system um, uh, in the educational systems uh, say for example we have to you know the commitment about teaching uh, or training the teachers and also the students it should the, this commitment has to come from the top so unless they are supportive uh, you know uh, it, it, it would not be beneficial and yes the policy support is also essential so uh, and we need you know uh, a new i'm not saying that new curriculum but we need to integrate sustainability into the already existing curriculum uh, you know and uh, uh, that's how you know we can do it thank you very much dr sapna jenny so well yeah hi again well thank you all for being here i think there were very interesting insights on sustainability and education uh i think there's one main outcome for me that you know the local skill and the universal skill they both uh, follow the same principles from mathematics to social sciences so um i think jamie mentioned something about uh, diffusion or dispersion yeah, these are the, the same models that we use and they're applicable to information and social development. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's it. I was, um, I think that, yeah, sustainability is a different concept in different areas. And what Dr. Marek says about the sister colleges, sister schools seems very promising. Uh, I would, it was a pleasure chatting with you. So if I can contribute in any way, please feel free to contact me. Thank you very much, Jenny. And Dr. Marek? Yeah, I, I would like to close with, with one reflection. You know, over, over the years, uh, during the lecture, I was asking my students, please think for a couple of minutes about the teacher who had the biggest impact on your life, was the best teacher ever. And they were thinking for a moment, and they say, OK, please share it with your neighbor now. Why, why did you think that this was the best teacher? And then I asked them, so please tell us. Well, I was hearing always and always over over and again. She was caring about us. She was always for us. She was defending us when we got in trouble. And, she, and so on and so on. And finally, he or she was passionate about their subject. So that should be good that a good teacher for the student is a teacher who is passionate about students and who is passionate about the subject. So we just need to find people who are passionate about students who educate about sustainability, and, and we need to be passionate about sustainability ourselves. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Marek. Thank you very much, all our speakers, for making this webinar a success, and to all our participants that have stayed tuned for two hours, we are very, very grateful. We'll share the recording with everyone uh, via the mailing list, so you can expect to, to see the recording after this call. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ashima, for moderating the early session. And I wish you all um, a fruitful day. Thanks, everybody. Thank bye -bye. you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.